This is the Rex monthly check-in call for August 2019. Today is Wednesday, August 14th. The end of summer is in sight if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, the days are beginning to get shorter and feel shorter. It's crazy. And uh, we start usually with a poem and I will read Nikki Giovanni's Choices, which goes as follows. If I can't do what I wanna do, then my job is not to do what I don't wanna do. It's not the same thing, but it's the best I can do. If I can have what I want, then my job is to want what I've got and be satisfied that at least there's something more to want. Since I can't go where I need to go, then I must go where the signs point, though always understanding parallel movement isn't lateral. When I can't express what I really feel, I practice feeling what I can express, and none of it is equal, I know. But that's why mankind alone among the animals learns to cry. Hmm. Well, I'll read it again. Choices by Nikki Giovanni. If I can't do what I want to do, then my job is to not do what I don't want to do. It's not the same thing, but it's the best I can do. If I can't have what I want, then my job is to want what I've got and be satisfied that at least there is something more to want. Since I can't go where I need to go, then I must go where the signs point, though always understanding parallel movement isn't lateral. When I can't express what I really feel, I practice feeling what I can express, and none of it is equal, I know. But that is why mankind, alone among the animals, learns to cry. And here's the link for the poem. Oh, Susan, greetings. You are muted by default, so we cannot hear you yet. Yes. The setting I have on my Zoom room. And That's right. With larger, with larger groups, it turns out to be important. Yes. Greetings. Did you catch the second reading of the poem? I did. I caught the first one too. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. I know someone I need to send that to. <laughs> I was thinking that same thing. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, there, there's, there's the link and it was an Oprah's choice somewhere along the road, etc. <laughs> Mr. Witzel, <coughs> how art thou this fair day? Hi, everybody. Hey there. Hi, David. You have clearly traveled out to some beautiful riverside gorge. If you get time to spend in Vermont, you just should absolutely do it. <laughs> Even if it's virtually. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> we, we were just a couple of days ago, uh, less than an hour out of town toward the River Gorge on the Columbia in a beautiful, beautiful park. Seriously gorgeous and uh, lovely sand underfoot. It felt like we were a couple hours away from town, but it was close by, so nice discoveries. Um, what, let's go around and do a little bit of Rexy check-in, like what's been on our, on our radars lately um, that feels like it's in the spirit of this Rex thing or more and more I'm heading into this design from trust thing. So when I check in, I'll describe that a little bit, but anybody want to go? And it doesn't have to land right on, right on Rex stuff because we, we usually find our way toward Rexy matters as it goes. Um, go, sorry, go ahead, Peter. It's, I haven't seen you in a long time. It's great to yeah, see you. Yeah, lovely to see you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of things I wanted to share. So, as you, so first is uh, the work at Academy, Art Academy, and then the other piece is uh, an client engagement that I'm doing about ambiguity cool so the the art academy um i probably can put a link here so what, what i want to share about the art academy at the end of the year at least in in this fourth year uh first of all we have to present our work in front of an external uh, jury but in this year, we also had a course on art and culture, um, which was given by a lady called Fiorella. And she had, it was so enjoyable. And she speaks in, uh, 
I mean, she talks about art uh, in, in a very poetic and a philosophical way. So I started writing down all her, uh, all the sentence, sentences that came out of her mouth, <laughs> naturally, because it really sounds like poetry and it, and it touched me uh, quite deeply. So there are some links on my blog post. I will, it's, it, the or, origin of this is in Dutch and I did a Google translate of it with some minor editing. So probably the English is terrible, but it's the best I can do. Cool. And so this link is uh, about the sort of things that she says. So like a statement like the chessboard is emotionless. I think it's absolutely fabulous. Oh. Or like when is something becoming tiring? When you cannot determine your own tempo. Wow. And you can take a small step, but take a huge, a huge space at the same time. Or the brain is like an office, a house with rooms. Sometimes you need other keys. Mm. And so it's, it's, it's full of that. So that's a, a share. And there's some other stuff about the Academy, like uh, what we were asked to write and select in terms of work. So I won't go into that. And then the other thing is uh, about ambiguity. Um, it's something, it, it's a, it's a, a client, I cannot name the client um, under such strict NDA. Mm -hmm. uh, but I started using some of the work or the input that we got during these calls from Jaime Kaisko, who wrote or who spoke about Bani sometimes ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jamey, you mean? Jamey. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't pronounce it well. So, I was like, when did we have a guy named Jaime on the call? I'm like, Jaime, Jaime, ah, it's Jamey. Yes. And he invented Bani as a re reply to VUCA. Correct. Yep. And what does um, Bani mean? Again? I will go ahead, Peter, and I'll also yeah. put it in the chat. It stands for the B of brittleness, the A of anxiety, the N of nonlinear, and the I of incomprehensible. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> yes. Incomprehensible. <laughs> I, I do not think that word means what we think it means, but still. <laughs> uh, but it should I, mean that. Yeah. So I did a little post on that as well, mm -hmm. which I will put into the blog. Um, where is the link here? I, I'm basically quoting Chame. Oh, I don't know how to pronounce this. <laughs> Chame, it's just like the French never. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this... Uh, this client work. There's your mate. Honey, the uh, We're just talking about you. Uh, you're, there we go. Uh oh. Yeah, I know. It gets worse from here. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hi. I had a, had a last minute need to get this done by yesterday kind of request. So, I mean, literally, as in like 15 minutes ago. So, I had to crash and get it done. So, well, thank you for joining. Um, and Peter was just telling us about our client project. Uh, if, if divulged, he would have to kill us all, but it's about ambiguity. And he wrote a post in which he quoted your thinking on Banny. Do you see in the chat, uh, his, li his link right now? Actually, I saw, I have, uh, I'm one of those awful people that has a, a Google alert whenever my name gets mentioned so online. Your so. early warning system, your dues line has in fact alerted your re emergency response system that you've been mentioned. I saw it and he used a, a giant picture of me. In oh my the, God, uh, seriously? Is it the one in the Nehru jacket with the pink? No, 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 no. It's oh, actually, it, there's a story behind the picture. I don't, I don't know if you know the story, Peter. Um, I, I don't. <clears throat> it's a picture that, that I took of myself in um, Sarajevo uh, dur doing a, uh, running a scenario project on the future of Bosnia-Herzegovina for the U.S. Oh. Agency for International Development. It was my 50th birthday. Yeah, literally the 50th birthday, I was sick as a dog um, running this. So basically halfway around the world, running a project for a group of people who didn't think they had a future um, and just felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. And that's the picture that you, that you used. 
Okay. <laughs> so now back to you in the booth, uh, Peter, and to, to continue your story. Sorry. That's okay. No, this is a great interlude. Thank you. Um, so the, 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 the client, so what we are doing, so I, I have teamed up uh, for this uh, thing with, uh, with Nextworks, which is the, the company of Peter Hinson. Uh, and the client, and I'm the lead designer of basically a leadership, leadership offsite. Uh, where I'm trying to combine what I did in the past with uh, InnoTribe, which was starting to feel like immersive uh, learning experiences, and do this at a smaller scale uh, for a group of 16 high potentials of a, of a client. And so the client asked us to work out something that uh, stretches those 16 people in uh, able to deal with ambiguity and uncertainty. And so it's a week program. And as we go through the week, we are basically in the design, turning up the volume of ambiguity, the further we go into the week. Uh, and we use all sorts of, um, of means. Uh, so we have also an, uh, an, an artist with us that is doing custom-made immersive soundscapes in 360 degree sound, that sort of thing. So it's really <laughs> a, a very cool project. But the Bani thing, uh, since you first mentioned it, Chamez, it's, uh, it's still uh, was uh, simmering in my head. And so the, the client was thinking in terms of uh, ambiguity and uncertainty, as I write in the blog, it basically inspired for the VUCA world. And I said, I'm going to inject this Bani thing in here. And there are some other blog posts coming in. So, so what I'm doing in this, this blog post, so the, the visual uh, metaphor for the ambiguity is the kayaker in the white water. And it's basically written here, but the kayaker can navigate the wild water with the white water by uh, basically by experience, by immersive experience, literally immersive experience. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it's, a non, it's part of, uh, because you also mentioned uh, when you talked about Bani, also the possible responses to it, which I documented also in the blog post. Mm -hmm. So the, the the anxiety and we had a discussion about that like a year ago or two years ago initially you said it's, it's empathy and then we had a discussion about agency that that may be another way to deal with anxiety anxiety so basically the the kayaker uh finds her stability by having gone through the white wa water many 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 times and so it, it has become an automatism and so the metaphor in a more abstract leadership type of context is the, the stability comes from the authenticity, integrity, and the personal agency of the person in the kayak, in the whitewater, in the Bani world. I'm going to, so there are two more posts coming. They are, they are published, they are written, but not yet published, which built upon this. Uh, one is about, is saying, who is the composer? And the other post, um, the other one is more ambiguous. Yeah, the other post is um, in draft still. Imagining worlds you believe in. Uh, and I'm trying to mix uh, the Bani world with something really, really cool I discovered. It's a book by a, a guy called Ian Cheng. And I think it's also in one of my recent blog posts. Um, the book is called Emissaries Guides to Worlding. Oh. It's 
absolutely fascinating, um, Ian Cheng, who is an artist, uh, performances, installations, and so on. Uh, let me see where I wrote that down. Let me see here. That's in my annual update, I think, about books. Oh, oh Emissary's down. Guide to Worlding. Got it. Yeah, I mean, my, my English is getting worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had written down a misery. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> and I don't think that's the same meaning. I don't know. <laughs> no. Correct me if I'm wrong, but... Uh... I don't know, misery and worlding does seem to be a natural fit for me. Yeah. These days, yeah. So there is this link that I'm adding here about the post that I did about an update of where what I'm doing these days. So you can skip the first part, which well, you can for this call, but there is somewhere in the middle books and there is the cover page of Emissaries Guide to Worlding. Oh, it's a uh, yeah so to make to not to do too many spoilers here but um he's talking about four um uh, four he calls them masks i would call them archetypes or voices that call upon the artist in creation mode and the, the four voices are the director the cartoonist, the hacker, and the emissary. Hmm. Oh. And the emissary's role is to create a world that is alive. And he also has a, a world aliveness score, which is basically um, the usage of the world versus like a mathematical uh, break one on two, like, uh, yeah. So the usage of the world and the presence or the activity of the creator. So the less the creator is involved in the world and the more people are using it, the more the world comes alive. That's the story. Mm. Highly, highly recommended. So, and Super interesting. Stop, stop here. Anybody thoughts? I love the the image of dealing with him. You get better at dealing with ambiguity by immersive experience. And I love the image of the kayaker in part because I can't stop thinking about how scary it is to get in the kayak the first time. You can like you're gonna have to do this a lot, and that's gonna be scary a lot of times before you get to the point where you're like, ah, okay, I have enough embodied experience to kind of get through this. That, that image will stick with me for a long time. And for me, something similar, which is um, my, my, my sport, I, I've gone back to Aikido, so I'm, uh, I'm doing that as my sport, which has been really, really great. And a lot of it is about your relationship to your partner, because Aikido is always partner work. You're doing something with someone else, they throw you, you throw them, you kind of switch roles all the time. And it so happens that one of our teachers in class has been spending a lot of time on, you know, give your weight to your partner and how to, and, and the two roles are called nage and uke. So uke is the attacker who eventually gets thrown. Nage is the one practicing the throw and you, you flip roles again. So it's funny because if I'm ever in an actual fight, I'm, I'm going to need a very polite and well-trained attacker. And if they attack on the wrong foot, I'm going to have to say, no, no, can you switch your stance? This is going to work out fine. Let's begin again. Exactly. Can we start over? Can you put, and, and I'm not trained yet on knives. Can you put the knife away and just come in with your hand and grab me on the wrist like this? And then I'll be, then I'll be great. Um, but I say all this because I think that the relationship between partners and Aikido is quite similar uh, and has a lot of lessons to the relationship to the kayaker and the water um, in terms of balance and forces and relationship. Like, like, Part of what a really skilled kayaker understands is this tippy balance point where they know when they're going to rotate and get sucked under and they know when they're not and they know just how far they can turn, not turn, how to avoid the eddy over there, uh, how to aim and steer with just enough energy that they don't get tired but they're going to make really great use of the river, it's, uh, any, any number of things. But, it, but there's, there's so much detail um, 
in the relationship and there's so much information in it. And what you get good at when you get experienced in either art is the information provided by all of the contact and all of the cues of the environment mm -hmm. in that relationship. And that, that's cool because uh, it gets you paying, uh, paying attention in the middle of turbulence. And I'll add one thing, which probably carries over nicely to kayaking as well. Sometimes you're, you're doing a very complicated throw. It, it, looks, it looks like a really weird thing. You're doing this, then you do that, then you do this. And when you kind of master it more or less and you're in the middle of it and you're looking around and you can see what's happening and you know what's next and you don't feel fear and you're kind of in the middle of chaos but you don't feel fear, that is a really good feeling, right? And so I think also that the reason really good kayakers stretch themselves and go into dangerous sort of situations is that they have understood how to be in that danger and how to they've mastered the control of themselves and their craft in that situation. And for junior people, that's scary. And for them, it's not. And there's some, some aspect of mastery shows up there. So just a couple of riffs on that, Peter. When you mentioned kayaking um, in the conversation, uh, I know you were talking about whitewater, whitewater kayaking. But what came to mind are the videos that I've seen, and I just posted a link to one, of people encountering whales when they're kayaking in relatively still water. And I think that's another interesting metaphor along those same lines, you know, because you think you're in still water, you are in still water, and then suddenly there's something massive and transformative rises up and overturns you. And so that's, that's redolent with metaphor as well. Awesome. Anyone else, other thoughts? <clears throat> All right, then. Would anyone else like to check in? After that? <laughs> <laughs> There's a whale to rise out of, the, out of the waters. I have a whale. You have one? Yeah. Well, what kind? Well, <clears throat> um, recently, um, I was, uh, had been told to write a couple of blogs and I thought, oh, well, uh, no, why not? So, um, uh, it's, it's not so much ambiguity that I'm after this in this as it is paradox. Um, and it was sparked by an email sent to me by a neighbor who, uh, is also was previously a colleague. Um, we've both moved in different directions. Um, about about um, writing political things for, um, well, what to do about climate, you know, how to write about climate change, how to talk about it, how to all, all kinds of things. There's a, a nice piece which I will add on to the uh, chat here uh, of someone who went to a workshop of George Lakoff sometime in the late, mid 2000s, and who pointed out, as I don't know if you know George Lakoff, of George Lakoff? Yes. yes. No. Know him personally. No. I, I know him personally too. He was, uh, for a long time, back in my linguistics days, <laughs> back when Chomsky walked out of the talk, out of the, the, uh, mm, Linguistic Society of America meetings, uh, when he, George Lakoff, and um, I'll think of his name in a minute, started talking about uh, semantics. And that was not supposed to be part of the linguistic theoretical enterprise. Hmm. Anyway, those were, those were bloody years. Um, and how that's good for communicating. Anyway, my little paradox is, um, and I always have to have something energy. And this is negative energy that's making me write this, okay? So we're going from the sublime to the ridiculous. Um, anyway, that will, uh, so I, I've gone back to something that you, some of you may have heard me talk about here, 
um, on the sociality of work and the sociality of learning. And um, uh, let's see, how can I get into this quickly? Um, Telepathy. Okay, good. Uh, we're done then. All right. So I'll just I'll just go in. Um, I've noticed that the pretty much work in the future of work world that I happen to reside in, um, at least some of the time, um, is uh, the on a purely practical level the um, this business of reduction of work to skills and tasks obscures, among other things, the social dynamics that it takes to hold everything together to put together all those little pieces to actually get the work done. And uh, as you know, some of you will know, I've actually labored with and done myself a lot of work practice analysis um, and negotiated agreements between people. Um, and one sees that there's a lot of hidden work that's never acknowledged, unseen, unhidden, invisible, shadow work. Now there's even a book about ghost work about all the people who do all the stuff for machine learning that just gets disappeared. Um, and here's, a, here's data from an actual example uh, from a tortured customer service interaction. It happens to be mine. Otherwise, as you will see, how else could I have gotten this data? <laughs> <laughs> no way. Anyway, and who, who could have imagined, think of this as I go along, who could have imagined all these players in this single, single customer experience, who was tracking all the social interaction it took to even begin to resolve the matter. Who could have imagined the complicated technical system, actually a technical social system, that emerged from integrating legacy systems, automation, task-driven work for all those people they wanted to hire who wouldn't need any complicated skills. So here's the situation. Uh, the refrigerator was two and a half years old, no longer under warranty. It stopped cooling, freezer and all, sometime on Sunday, February 11. A couple of years ago. Right after the warranty timed up. Yes. I learned about this from my guests on Monday morning, February 12th. My guests, in this case, Airbnb guests. So it was urgent. Monday morning, February 12th. It took until uh, Wednesday, March 21st, a month later, who a tech rep finally showed up, came in, diagnosed the problem. It needed a new compressor. The compressor would be shipped to me. Little did anyone know that the rains of 2017 would cause a main road to collapse into a mudslide and UPS couldn't or wouldn't deliver, but that was only one of the minor things. Okay, so here are the players. The refrigerator, the owner of the refrigerator, the guests of the owner, three friends of the owner who have suffered through this, the sister of the owner who also suffered through these stories, the man who manages the off the grid electrical system at the owner's property, and who had to be consulted frequently about what to do next. The manufacturer, who should have been a player but isn't. The store where the refrigerator was purchased, which should be a player but isn't. The extended warranty service, purchased as a service was being sought and provided by a home services provider with a good name and who had provided service at the owner's home four to five times over the last 33 years. The service provider, a contractor to the warranty service, eight technicians, T1 through T8, at least five customer service reps on the phone for the warranty service, two people at the service provider, functions unknown, UPS both at the national and the local level. And the now, road crews. And the road crews. Well, they weren't even there yet. Contact information the owner had to provide or find out during the service included this. The reason I started keeping this was I, I drew a map myself so I could figure out what the system was because it was just too impenetrable. The, uh, so there was the information I had to provide or that I had to find out or figure out during the service, much of which was not easily obtained. So the owner's landline number uh, my, with voicemail, the cell phone number with its own voicemail and text, uh, the owner's email, a lot of no reply email from the warranty service, um, Customer satisfaction in inquiries via email only for the last two tech appointments out of eight. The property address where the refrigerator is located. The gate address for the property address of the refrigerator, which everybody kept getting confused. Warranty services phone numbers. Service providers phone numbers. 
text messages from the warranty service, text messages from one of the eight texts, voice models and calls from the warranty service provided for both the owners and landline and the cell phone, et cetera, et cetera. And cell phone calls from tech three, four, five, and six, the UPS website, UPS and Menlo Park, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so in the end, the eight techs were involved. Four techs didn't either come because they ran out of time, had a truck breakdown, or because even though the refrigerator had been diagnosed with a faulty compressor, um, which somehow didn't make it through the system, they uh, ended up with not enough time assigned, so you had to ask for three hours. And I had to double check every time a tech rep was assigned to come out to work on this compressor uh, that um, to make sure that it was a particular kind of service that was at least three hours off. Was this all at Long Ridge? Yeah. Okay, so just a, just a side note for everybody else. Uh, this is on a property that is three miles down a windy mountain road on the other side of Silicon Valley toward the ocean. But um, it's only 30 minutes from Silicon Valley. It's, it's, really, it's a short hop, but, but, it's, but once, you, once you hit the gate that lets you down that windy road, it's another three miles down really twisty roads that you're saying some of that road was wiped out? Yeah. Oh my God. Well, okay. it, that happens. The other well, thing that got wiped out was a skyline. Ha happens to me all the time. I, I'm here in the Pearl in Portland and we have a like road wipeout that means we can't get out of Dodge for, you know. Yeah. Anyway, go, you, can, you can resume, but I think people need to understand the challenges of actually getting to the property as well. Yes, yes. Yes, it's not all the, on their side. Right. They should no, have sent a... It's not uh, equipped to handle something like this. Um, okay, so... This is where drone delivery starts to be really good, by the way. They would come to the gate ad address. I once waited an hour and a half at the gate address, and the guy who was supposed to come out was about 50 feet from me the whole time. There's no cell phone service there, right? So we didn't find each other. Uh, th this goes on for six weeks. Anyway, uh, let's see. The, sent the compressor was sent to the wrong address. It was sent to 3400 Long Ridge Road, but UPS couldn't find that. So they took it to the office in UPS. By that time, the road skyline had, had caved in and we couldn't use it. And so it was a three hour round trip to UPS to pick it up. Now, all these questions are, are about scheduling and communication between the warranty service, the server provider, the techs, and the owner. No one can talk to anyone else. No party can see the other's websites. There were double bookings. The booking I was told was not the one that was on the books. I mean, whose books were they on? Six weeks without a refrigerator was onerous. Now, of course, this is annoying, but my question <laughs> is that the whole system seemed to be predicated on individual people completing a task often by themselves, probably gig workers. It stands as a glaring example of what happens when getting work done cuts out the opportunities for repairing misunderstandings, opportunities to make sense of inconsistencies. Um, and now that I'm, now I'm stuck. But anyway, that's what I've been pondering and trying to get to, okay, what is it I really think people could hear um, about this? But it just strikes me that it's a really good example of sociality of work. Um, the sociality of work, the interactions either between and among individuals or between and among the various um, social entities, whether they're formal or informal, uh, play a role in getting, getting work done. And yet that's all been disappeared. Um, I got a note from a colleague who said, well, uh, but it's sort of strange because in Uber, you have these, you have all this evidence, et cetera. And then I said, well, uh, it, just on the surface, and it's a one-to-one -one thing, and it, you know, maybe they have the same skills, I don't know. But then I recounted a Lyft experience, which I will not bore you with, but which I did write down, and I threw out all the data one day in a fit of cleaning. But roughly it was that I got to San Francisco airport, left the phone in the taxi cab. It fell out of my pocket. Got into the airport, couldn't find my telephone. I had my Mac, I looked up, find my phone. My phone was on the Bay Bridge, traveling on over to, it turns out, Berkeley. Yes. And um, I managed to reach the driver. Uh, and it turns out he had to go to Oakland and it wasn't, he wasn't going to not make it back in time to give me my phone. So I thanked him and I, but he confirmed that the phone was in his car. 
So I called Lyft and I talked to a nice woman who, from the help situation, she said, but I can't contact the driver. I'm not allowed to contact the driver. I said, well, what should he do with it? This is starting to remind me, remind me of the refrigerator. Well, what you should do is um, tell him to take it to, um, I don't know how it landed there. I'm missing a piece of the story. But it landed in the San Francisco uh, court, city court building in Lost and Found. So then I talked to a nice lady several times. By then I was on my trip. I was in Ohio. And I was talking to her every other day. Very nice. She said, well, maybe I can mail it to you. And then we discussed whether it would get to Ohio or whether she should mail it to my home address or everything else. Then we discovered that she can't mail it to me. It's not allowed. And somebody else probably can't pick it up for you because they don't have your ID. Exactly so. <clears throat> exactly so. Right. So eventually I drove That's to fun. San Francisco and I went to the... Now, I mean, this really, I mean, it's all onerous. We've all had bits and pieces of it. But those two examples stand out as just a stark picture of systems that are completely untethered. So. In, and intentionally so. Yeah. Now, Kelly's Consortium deals a lot in break fix situations and has for quite a couple decades. When did the consortium start? 25 yeah. years ago. Okay, 25. What would you do? Yeah. I mean, what, what's start. the lesson you take away from this? I mean, I find this as a student of work practice, I see this happening and I go, sure. you guys are just really, this is, this is not going to work and you won't know that it's not working. Right. And it's, and it's largely because they, people don't design from trust, right? There, it's, the, it's the intent of bringing in the lowest cost resource to do the work. And people, the, the idea that we can, once we collect enough data about what our customers are doing, we can then automate everything and move to the lowest cost resource to solve any emergent problems is completely false. Because once we capture the things that we know our customers are having problems with, now we have to solve more complex, more interesting new problems, right? And so we have exactly the wrong people in place to do that once we have formatted. Well, I, I completely agree with you. And I've been telling a story something like that before. And I guess I should have been paying much more attention. To <laughs> <laughs> so we just, well, so we just, um, because this methodology that we've developed over the last 25 years is really good at capturing known issues and moving them to self-service. And because we have discovered that once the people you, you need a high skill set of employees to solve new issues, right? Yeah. The best way to get them to work together to solve new issues is to put them in a situation where they can collaborate. And so this new, this emergent model, which we call intelligence swarming, we just published a paper on in April. Um, it's sort of everything we know about this model. I put a link in the chat, but okay. it's about how to help people collaborate, how to get the best person to answer the question um, at the point that it's asked right, without going through 35 right. service providers. Right. And, and you have to build your system from trust, right? You have to enable the, the, in the people who are capable, that you are enabling the most capable, not designing a system that mitigates the risk of the least capable. And so it exactly dovetails into Jerry's work, right, around how we're building these systems. Because it's the, the amount of inefficiency built into both of those stories really, like, makes my anxiety explode. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. And so you can imagine I was, my, it was exploding in two directions. One was right. the refrigerator to get fixed because I had paying guests. Okay. And also because I, I could see how it all got to be there. Right. Um, and and I, I agree that many things. Okay, but my the drum I have been beating on, okay, for the last 35 years, okay, and which has been written about and encoded in various many ways, um, starts from a different kind of place. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'm I'm we should have a real serious conversation, but basically, you know, because Maybe I don't have to do all this work practice analysis. Maybe I could just advise people to do that. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a deep question. Well, and the trick is, so it's a, I, I suspect you have a much broader perspective than we do, right? Because we grew up in high tech customer support. And that's, so that's what uh, the perspective that all of our stuff is, is written from. But I think, um, 
in both of the com like both of these situations that you described, it's a how do you do that from across uh, across organizational across company and situation? across apps, across these huge right. systems that don't talk to each other. That's right. Mm -hmm. Even the modern ones are designed to not talk to each other, and okay. the others are sort of accidental, right? Yeah. Just to offer uh, another little piece, maybe which is you're busy calling these people and then like dictating phone numbers and addresses and saying i'll meet you over here why isn't our communication accompanied by an artifact that that is like a like a web page or a wiki page where all the relevant information about this particular case can live and it's not like you haven't told people for 30 years how to get to long ridge so instructions on how to find you you know what to do in case of a problem whatever whatever could just live in a little module that you're like oh yes they're going to need to get here so here's that module well and, and i give them those and they never make it through the system well no but but I, part, partly what i'm saying is there's no way for all of us to see this same sort of thing you're busy giving them little links and piecemeal stuff through whatever the narrow little pipe you have to that particular rep and it, there's no place for this all to live and what you know why not well, because we don't trust people. Would I put that all out there? Mm. Yeah, I'm living out here by myself. Well, this could be a private, uh, private communication between you and whoever it is you're dealing with, but then all the parties involved could see the shared information about here's the make model of the, of the fridge in, in question, blah, blah, blah. Right, this is Doc Serial's VRM work. Right. Yeah, there's we, a piece of that as well. In terms of like, I here's here's the information that I am willing to put out into the world, and here are the people I'm going to allow to see that information right. for yeah. this period of time, or whatever. Right. Exactly. So, is there such a thing? Not yet. Well, not that I know. Not that I know of that is working on a scale that we need it to work on. <laughs> you could. You could hack. Well, you could, I mean, I think yes, yes, and uh, and you yes. Could, I mean, you we could easily to hack it together, though. Pardon. You could hack it together. You could basically create a Google Doc and just give a few people permission to go see it. And if they had permission in their call center to go on the intertube open. yes. and open the document, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of permissions and other sorts of things, but the technology to share and talk through and that's collaborate not, kind of exists. Well, not, yeah, well, we all know that's not. Yes, but one, one thing I did do when, and I should probably do again, was we were awfully worried about getting healthcare out here and research the helicopters when we were building a house. Wow. And I had a one page thing framed by the back door that had all the information, health information, everything, everything to give to a provider. The fire department was completely blown away when they arrived by hmm. that. And they said, how come not everybody does that? Yeah. Do I now have one by the back door? No. <laughs> That's how far we've moved forward. Oh, well, I'll stop on this, but I think the point I kind of want to, I mean, it's just a small point, but this, this rush, I mean, every conversation I go into, whether a future work conversations, is all about, and they say, oh, these are the skills people are going to need, you know, and I'm thinking, how does anybody know what those skills are? IBM used to have 4,000 skills, they're never updated, and who in the world now knows what skills are needed to get anything particular thing done, now that we're completely specialized? Mm -hmm. Why do, we, um, why do we even think this could work? Peter just put a link to uh, the Osaka uh, digital asset grid. Do you want to talk about that? That'd be good. Yeah. So when I was at Swift um, in 2012, uh, we showcased a project uh, that was called the digital asset grid, uh, which was in essence an evolution of Doc Searle's VRM uh, concept. So Doc Searle has been working on, with us at the time on this. He was uh, one of the advisors. And so were people from uh, Respect Network and so on were all uh, working on this. So we built a, a full-blown prototype that basically allowed to share any type of information with any node on a network. And I think the key image on that, ah, ah, it's in the, the two key images on that blog post, it's the camel in the water, which is the metaphor for the human in, in the sea of data. Yeah. So it's like the fish in the, in the water. 
Let's put some camel in the water. And the other is the, uh, the thing, the square that says location rights, who and trust. So to the point that uh, I think Jerry made just in the call, we used a particular technology. It, it doesn't really matter what the technology was. It was XDI, XRI, or something like that. Um, today, they would, somebody, they would call it blockchain. Yeah? But it, it doesn't matter. The technology doesn't matter. What we found is that the real hard thing to do in communities of trust is to agree on the the rules of the game in terms of expressing location where the data sits on the rights that people have on that data where they want to give to the third person on that data who it's all about identity which is still an unsolved problem and levels of trust in the which has to do with also regulatory compliance and what happens if something goes wrong and who got the liability, basically who can sue who, yeah. which has to be part of a trust model. So it's not a technology. So there is a lot of thinking that has been done in, in this project on how to share digital asset grids. So we had a big show about that in Osaka. And there is, I think, a video about that somewhere on the internet. And two weeks later, the company decided to kill the project. Yes, of course. Yeah. But that's been my experience for years, is that you can build these things. They work. Yes. And then, and then they're killed. I mean, that's its own dilemma. How many of us have actually, I mean, if you ask how many successful projects that have done what I set out to do. And mind you, they're very simple, simple things <laughs> most of the time. Um, ever actually went forward. And I think now, this they is can go a... forward in ways that are unseen. Yeah. And you run into them 10 years later, which is lovely. So, so this the, is a lovely, the, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, the, the lessons learned. Yeah. Uh, from this, why, why did it, why was the project killed, basically? <clears throat> uh, I think I can summarize them in three buckets. One is the, the name, the brand of the project. Uh, two, it's um, positioned this within, um, within the problem thinking of the customer and third it's be very aware about the stretch or the, dis the discrepancy between the language that the project people have developed yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and the people that have to listen to the people who have been working on the project so they start talking a language that is not understood anymore by yeah. the others the the point on the name of the project as as you can see, we had this really fancy name, Digital Asset Grid. Um, so I always tell the story, imagine that you have a conference for bankers and there are two conference rooms and on one conference room it says Digital Asset Grid and on the other one it says Mobile Banking. Where do you think the bankers go? Yeah. And the customer thing, it's, it's not necessarily to say that this is solving a particular problem, but it's positioned in a constellation of existing problems that have to do with regulation, with trust, with that and that, and it can address a number of those problems. Yeah, it's not, but you basically talk the, the language of the customer. That's a long story short. Stop here. <clears throat> um, and I'll, let me just jump in with, I was just uh, giving myself a little reminder in the chat, and I, uh, Moltke is super interesting, so Jamea is just, uh, there's also uh, uh, Tyson, right? Mike Tyson, everybody has a plan, then they, then they, then they get hit. <laughs> that, that, that's clearly he was thinking about Moltke, clearly Tyson is a that's student right. of Moltke. 
You're, mu you're muted, Jermaine. We don't hear you. <clears throat> ah, I think I know what you said. Did it have to do with, uh, I, did it have to do with how Mike Tyson smokes $40,000 worth of marijuana a month? 40K? <laughs> that, was a, that was a headline yesterday, and I was like, ha, ha, never mind. I don't even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Must be really good marijuana. Maybe that's yeah. what it is. It's yeah. the best. It's yeah. artisanal. Yeah. Artisanal. <laughs> artisanal weed. Yeah. Um, so, so this question sort of pops up in a couple of ways. I just I want to broaden out to a, a question that's in the back of my head which is uh, how do projects survive as intended? And Susan, when you were sort of telling that, that story and kind of asking that question, I was reminded about grad school. And in grad school, one of the interesting lessons I had was I was taking courses simultaneously from Russell Acoff, one of the inventors of systems thinking, and from Ed Bacon, who was the city planner of Philadelphia for 50 years. When I took his course in the architecture school at Penn, uh, he was 74 years old, used sexual metaphor and meant it. <clears throat> and like what, what was like really super interesting and but his projects for the city of Philadelphia got crippled in different ways so it was, it was interesting to see what got through and what didn't because Acoff uh, consulted to Alcoa, Martin Marietta, the governments of Mexico and, and Iran, uh, uh, Anheuser-Busch, Mars, a whole series of companies that really actually followed his Volvo, <clears throat> a whole series of companies that actually followed his, his advice. He's one of these quiet behind the scenes consultants who changed a whole bunch of things, who's gotten more famous with age because people rejected his ideas a lot early on uh, for a, a variety of reasons. And, and then there's this other question of when something changes, is it people or place or institution that got changed? And I'm landing on the people side more and more and more because when the people who were part of something really fascinating. When they leave and graduate and go spread the ideas <clears throat> to somewhere else, it's very seldom that the institution retains the capacity to keep doing the thing. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that the people's capacity and the, the match between what they learned and what they were good at somehow really flourishes and works. And once they leave, um, found, you know, founder leaves the project and suddenly thing goes haywire or other people come in and fund it and they decide to turn it this way instead of that way, who knows what. But, but I'm, I'm coming back to more and more it's about humans uh, in particular. And, and if we can develop a lot of humans and get them to, co to speak and collaborate very openly, then maybe the ideas disseminate you know, more like a gas through the medium and the broader idea survives better that way. Uh, because in the old days, it, when it was just a human, if they left their ideas, unless they published a book or something, remember books? Like, how does that work? Go ahead, Susan. I was just gonna add to that that um, yes, but I, and, I mean, I, I think what I've convinced myself of also over time uh, is that that's not enough. Um, and we've been doing that and we know how that goes. We keep forgetting that there is something called practice, the way things work around here. And that those, those, create, those create social boundaries. And we're forever dealing, and the people who do the real work, of keeping those ideas or embedding those ideas in, in organizations or across organizations, uh, there's a whole ecology at work, right? And different types of people it takes for this to, to work out. But the practice is where it's grounded and lives and is effective. Um, if you don't have a practice or you haven't thought about that or you haven't descended, if that hasn't been moved or people have not been attracted to it, and at that point, it becomes an adaptation adoption thing. And it goes off and it flies off in all kinds of directions, which is fine. It's just, it's just gonna do that. That's the nature of human. But the fact that this is a socially bounded, sometimes the boundaries are really strong, like glass ceilings. But right. socially bounded entity, <laughs> if you will, it's not quite a thing, um, is, is where that, the, the, that's where the uh, sustain, sustain, uh, sustainability comes from. That and and longevity. Mm -hmm. See, I have um, I, I I completely agree that it's it's people in this situation. My experience of why it's people it differs a bit. Um, a lot of it comes from um, competition over territory. In my in my experience, in my personal experience, and I don't want to generalize too much, but my personal experience across a variety of industries. From, from the entertainment world to the consulting world to you know, strat you know, business strategy, uh, the more that a, an idea is linked to a 
person's and, and an identity of a person, the more that their successor, either direct replacement or somebody coming in that taking on some of the worst responsibilities, will want to push it away. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, it's a not invented here. Um, this is, I want to make sure that you know this is my territory. And, you know, I've been on multiple projects that got, that got killed suddenly, you know, seemingly out of the blue because somebody new took over at a higher level in the company and said, no, that was my predecessor's project. It's gone. I'm not interested in that. That's, and, you're not thinking of the government, are you? <clears throat> no, yeah. actually, none of those are government. In my, those no, have all been corporate. the same way. I'm, 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 I'm no doubt, no doubt. But I'm saying yeah. that, that there, there is a very strong sense of, it's not just that the institutional knowledge has gone, it's that the, um, the political support has gone and it's incumbent upon the successor or the replacement to uh, create a, an artifact that identifies with them, not simply taking on and right. enhancing well, the, the yes, existing I artifact. Couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more, right? I think that if we want to address that, however, I mean, it's sort of like, okay, what do we have to work with in this system that we think is dysfunctional? We keep trying to redesign the system. I don't think we can. I don't think the nature of social and human uh, whatever can be redesigned exactly. It changes, right? And you can change it in certain ways, but it's not going to change wholesale. So sometimes, sometimes it does. Sometimes really big things break and really big things change. I mean, there's, there's moments of huge institutional change. And then there's centuries of institutional stasis. So the, the, <clears throat> the moments of punctuated equilibrium are, are rare. I'm, I'm reminded here but, of a- However, if we want to make that happen- Yeah. I'm reminded here of a story that I think, this is, this is like a decade and a half ago I heard, and I think it was about the military, but in the military they generally switch you, you switch posts every two years. And it turns out that in this procurement or planning office, basically the average length of a project was like four, five, six years for anything that anybody started. And so they would be switching administrators every two years. Every administrator needed to put their mark on the department. So basically wouldn't pick up the, and continue to completion the projects that, had, that their predecessor had left yeah. and started a whole bunch of new things that would predictably die because every two years they'd shift yeah. desks. Exactly. And it took them a long time to figure out that this was hurting them. Um, at which point maybe they change what they do, right? Maybe they change the institutional design because I, I'm, I'm, I didn't know this, but I'm fascinated by institutional design. Would never have predicted that. Um, wouldn't but, have, see, I would have predicted that. About me? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. What's that? What's that referring to? Institutional design. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I, I could not have told you in, you know, grad school that I would love institutional oh. design and that, that, that that plus kind of strategy plus the scripts in our heads would mm -hmm. be a major piece of what I'm just absorbed into. And, 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 and in all of this, I'm always looking for what is, what is the, the Wu way? What is action through least action? What is the tiniest thing that we can do that causes a catalytic shift of consciousness or intention or approach or understanding or relationship that suddenly shifts things into a different mode of being? You're thinking a keto again. Yeah. And what happens when the unit that needs to I sound, I don't mean to sound, I sound challenging. I'm just trying to figure this out. <laughs> yeah, we, we too, we too. We're not taking this as a challenge. He says, I completely agree with and I'm going, oh, why are we still here? <laughs> why have we, I mean, what is it that we're not understanding about the human condition? Or, so I, think, I think Dave has the answer to that. He's been very quiet, but I think he knows the answer to that one. Okay. Only if it involves gin. <laughs> Not enough gin? That's probably it. Yeah. yeah. I, I can imagine that's true too. So speaking from my little um, single methodology sort of uh, kind of uh, test bubble here, right? So, <laughs> so the, the consortium has developed this methodology called KCS, which is knowledge-centered support or knowledge-centered service now. And it's a method by which we capture, structure, reuse, and improve information yep. or in knowledge, right? So specifically in support environments. And um, it's a double loop process. So that 
capture structure reuse improve is the is the reactive loop and then there's a reflective loop the the salt the evolve loop so um in which we look at all the patterns that we've captured from the from the a loop so um one of the things that we have said is that this methodology it's not so different for frontline support agents because they're if they encounter a new problem they're taking notes anyway we're just asking them to do it in a slightly different location so that the rest of the organization can benefit from the knowledge that they capture it's a huge difference for the first and second line managers because we're asking them to stop counting things like um, average handle time or um, uh, number of cases closed or right we're asking them to stop counting activities and start um, trying to measure value which is a huge disruptor for them in addition we're asking them to start acting as coaches for their support agents or knowledge workers as opposed to managers right top-down managers and and as a result one of the things um, that that we say is that we've never seen a KCS implementation work without a KCS coaching model so this is, this is also a little bit my check-in, right, in terms of what I've been working on and thinking about lately, mm -hmm. in which we have, I think, completely eroded this idea of coaching um, in terms of like, well, I have to go get coached now, which means I get to go here with all the things that I've been doing wrong, as opposed to sort of well, an act. Yeah, yeah, right. Let me give you some feedback. Like, here's what I think you're doing wrong. Um, and so as opposed to kind of the the true intent of um, like, an, like an executive coaching model, which is what would you like to get better at? Like here I am to help you with your personal goals. And so I just went to a KCS coaching class, which I had not ever done before um, with the woman who developed this coaching um, methodology for our methodology. Um, and it was completely inspiring because it was two days of people talking to each other about how they wanted to interact right? How they were going to be in a room together and what kinds of things, how they were going to support each other and giving really focused attention to the relationship as opposed to the tool, which we always blame, right? Well, I can't do this thing because the tool won't let me capture it in this way and it takes too much time, blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, the, the complaining about the people. It was a we're going to actually sit down and talk about like we're, we are putting some formality around the way we want to interact with each other. And I think that um, this is a huge missing piece around, around our entire organizations, right? Especially as we go to sort of like the skills and, and processes of work, we, we recognize that there's a need for sort of this human interaction. And there's also um, a total sort of, we have no structure around how to have a difficult or uncomfortable conversation. Right. Because in addition, we're supposed to be very pleasant and getting along with our coworkers and being, you know, in in the in the uh, in the process or whatever, as opposed to being people together in a process. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about how I think that this is maybe the way we shift um, if what we really want to have is a is sort of a trusted network of people who are solving problems together, right? And the network is bigger than just an organization. It's all the people who you have to have fix your refrigerator. Um, that there's there are perhaps skills that we're not teaching, or there's a expectation of communication or relationship that we're not at all setting. There's a huge opportunity to sort of say let's be coaches for each other. Let's set aside some time to actually talk about what you want, how you're going to get there, you know, what's, what's next for you, what's not working. Um, and then, and then we can switch roles and do that for each other because, because we, we keep talking about bringing our whole selves to work, except that there's actually no space to, to arrive as your whole self. So that's all I have to say about that. I was just going to say that. So there's so much, uh, there's so much this right about that. I mean, I, I can, from my, from my rat hole, yeah. <laughs> my rat hole, I recognize a lot of what, of what you're doing and thinking that works too. Um, it also works. It also works to, uh, once we were trying to reinvent, I mean, it was one of these impossible cases where management wanted to shut down the nice office in a suburb of Dallas and move everybody into a refurbished chicken warehouse north of Dallas. That sounds hospitable. Oh yeah. And 
wanted, um, and they wanted to combine, they wanted every customer service rep to be able to handle the three main, the three main jobs, mm -hmm. uh, technical support, sales of oh. paper and toner, you know this case, and three, um, uh, Billy. So, right, and pay them $5 an hour. Mm -hmm. So we said, we can do this. <laughs> and we did. <clears throat> um, we, uh, you know, and, and we did it on many on the same principles that, that you had, but we also, uh, first we had to show the people themselves what each other knew. Uh, mm -hmm. We videotaped their work as they were working and we picked out the people I had on the project. I didn't picked out scenes that uh, that em were emblematic of mm. collaboration and cooperation. So somebody would be on a phone, and you'd see somebody pulling something out of there. This is back in the day when you didn't not screens but paper, and the, handing it over the the cubicle mm. wall to the other person. Oodles of this stuff. You know, you're already doing it. So then we set up a learning environment with all three functions, two people from each, so that they would be able to compare notes in a U-shaped thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started to, and again, you know, started to just expose people to mimicry, imitation, uh, to all that with a reflective loop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what, after a long time, uh, months, okay, they had, we had it down that they were doing, they were, uh, got their, their goal was $400 per person per day of sales and, uh, various other things. And we actually got it there. Wow. Now, and then to go back to Jamais point, um, they shut the project down <laughs> partly because there were three, three managers who were going to lose their jobs. Oh, wow. And well, lose well, there was only going to be one survivor, right? They're going to man, it was either going to be the billing person or the, or somebody new, right? And, um, and, and it happened to be that the, I actually cried when that happened because yeah. <laughs> it had been such a successful yeah. thing. Anyway, the board, the chairman of the, the, the CEO of the company happened to be on our board. I was at the Institute for Research on Learning at the time. We had a board meeting and told this story and he said, oh, I guess we shut it down too soon. Wow. And there are many lessons to take from that. Uh -huh. But even in the audience, you know, with the CEO to tell them the story of, this is what you wanted to have happen. This is how it happened. This, it happened on the front lines. It can be repeated, which I then, it took me another me another, you know, seven or eight years to get a situation such that I could actually use that model uh -huh. <laughs> and, and move it into another organization. But so one, well, and the, the other thing we talk about with KCS, because this is, this also is a threat in which people are like, wait, I'm not going to give you all my knowledge, then you're going to fire me. Right. In which that, the, yes, the, 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 the conversation then has to become your job is not delivering known answers. Your job is solving new problems. And so if you think your job is delivering known answers, that job's not going to be around that long. So you might want to come play with us in, in this space. But the other the, we, there's a tool that we use to help people get through the executive revolving door, which we call the strategic framework, which just puts on a single sheet of paper. Um, this, the stakeholder, the, the benefit or the goal and the measures that we're using to, to, right. you know, say that this is working. And it amazes me how few people actually spend an hour to sit down and write it all down because we're like, if, if only when your you know, new vice president walked in, you could be like, remember how the CEO said he wanted to do this? This is how KCS is contributing to this thing you could just hand them a piece of paper and talk them through it. And they're like, yeah, but it takes so much thinking. <laughs> Darn. Oh, right, okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that, that, that was why I jumped on another opportunity when I was at IBM to, in, to try to embody, because one of my principles is, if you have to leave your work to do something, people won't do it. Mm. They just won't. They don't. So what if the work 
was had to be done in the same place that the traces of what got done were. So IBM at the time had come up with, um, oh, what was it called? Connect Connections, a social media platform to end all social media platforms. And it was so complicated. I mean, I remember, I tried to use it. I embodied the method, okay, mm -hmm. in Connections. So that if you, if you use the tools and did anything to get your work done, it automatically collected that kind of, not distilled information, but at least collected artifacts along the way, which I found were much more easier to use. People say, write a letter that blah, 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 and they give you a template. Mm. What if you had four or five examples that you could just copy from? So, uh, well, you know, and then the CEO changed. And then they, <laughs> and then they, they disbanded the, two consult, the consulting function that they were supposed to be doing it in. I don't know what the, I mean, this is a wicked problem. I mean, these are all wicked problems. And I don't, don't think they're solved. I think they're resolved. Um, ACOF used to talk about dissolving problems. <clears throat> dissolving problems, yeah. Because he would reframe, he would yeah. Yeah, reshape whatever the system was. Anyway. And sometimes it is really simple. We've got 15 minutes left in our call. Would anybody else like to check in and throw something different into the conversation for a moment? Sure. Yay. Uh, yay. <clears throat> so I just got back, you know, maybe two weeks ago from a very last minute trip to Dubai. Uh, as last minute as in uh, the tickets arrived on, or the tickets were purchased on Monday, I flew on Thursday. Um, the uh, Emirates business, so. Oh, nice. That works, that's nice. Yeah. Um, this is for the, uh, Dubai is, hope, is hosting the World Expo 2020. And so through a, a zany set of misadventures, I've gotten involved with one of the, with the groups that is doing immersive content for one of the pavilions. And it was, um, they basically had been writing scripts and you know, getting handed to one person then to another. And they say, this is great, make these changes. And it, several iterations of that. And eventually they said, well, why don't you just come out here and we can talk in person and get this done. Um, and uh, that's fun. And so basically dealing with this crew of people who um, none of them are actually from Dubai. There was a, a Scottish guy who runs an international construction company, a British guy who manages all, you know, the overall pavilion. You know, it's basically the guy I work with is British but living in China. Uh, and I'm sitting there basically doing rewrites on the fly while the people are talking about things. And so they love me. Uh, be, basically because I was able to turn stuff out really quickly. You were way too with, flexible. With, <laughs> with uh, reason, reasonable quality. Um, and, I know that problem. <laughs> Jerry knows that problem. Yeah. Yes. Um, but, and it was fine. Uh, the, there was a moment though that really shook me and had nothing to do with the project itself. Um, but where I was and what was going on, uh, one, the, the Gilroy mass shooting happened when I was there and the next, you know, the morning after one of the, the Scottish guy comes up and says, you know, I heard about what happened in California and I immediately thought of you and I just want to offer my condolences. And that's really wonderful. It's very touching. And I'm, and I was very grateful. At the same time, I felt ashamed. You know, here I am, you know, and I, literally halfway around the world. And, you know, I'm having people offer me condolences about stupid shit happening in the United States that only happens in the United States. And it was just a moment of, well, I'm really happy to have that moment, that this point of human connection. I really, really, really wish that it didn't, that wasn't happening, that this, all of this wasn't happening. Uh, 
because mm-hmm. it was very uncomfortable and like i said kind of kind of humiliating to feel because you know you know and later on after he had a bit to drink he said you know what the hell is happening in the united states but you know this shit happens you have no control over and yet it is connected to you mm-hmm. uh, and i know that has nothing to do with uh it being a particularly rexy event but it was well, in many industries <laughs> kind of the mo- the standout moment of an otherwise you know tedious and brief trip to the other side of the planet yeah but the story you just told is is pointing to a really rexy conundrum in the world right now which is what is motivating people to go shoot people up and uh one of the big threads heading into this is the the great replacement theory Mm-hmm. Um, and it's basically that white people fear that white people are going to be at least in the minority and maybe just wiped out. White, white genocide, it's called. And, um, and these people are convinced that this is happening and that they are being heroes by creating terror such, such that people who are not white, who are presently in, in the U.S. will leave and other people will not be motivated to show up. And that's, they think they're playing a heroic role in that. And, and people who are white will take up arms and take action, in, but with their inspiration. Exactly. And, and, and so that sort of seems to be happening because this thing is snowballing. And my fear is that we're just seeing the front tail of yeah. a much larger movement to do basically a one-off insurgency where you can't catch who's doing it because it's not a bunch of people that got together. It's a bunch of people who are individually motivated and through what's available today could arm themselves, train themselves, motivate themselves, and post a video on Facebook. Etc. Mm-hmm. So, so how do we interrupt that script? How do we earn enough trust to be in that conversation? How, and, and by the way, the people on the other side of that conversation are finding camaraderie, community, and sort of heroism in doing this. And they've talked each other into this point of view. And, and to me, it's like after Sandy, uh, after, uh, Sandy Hook, after like an elementary school shoot up, I'm like, there's something completely twisted here. That we, can, that we can walk past babies, children being shot dead in a school and think that the answer to that is, let's give every kid a Kevlar backpack and let's have fewer doors and guards on the doors and arm the teachers. I'm like, there's something completely screwed up about a society that is contemplating those answers to that problem, right? And so for a future call, because we've got 10 minutes left on this one, maybe we, we can dip our toes in, that, in those waters because to me, that's one of the, big issues on earth. And, and that one resonates with and is coupled with the, the shift to the far right around the world, <clears throat> largely blamed on immigrant populations, which is kind of a broadening of the great replacement theory. It, it, there's a series of beliefs about what's happening longer term. I mean, and what's weird is that the great replacement theory is a demographics issue. It, it, it plays out over decades. Mm-hmm. This is long term thinking on the part of a whole bunch of people who are then taking short-term action to interrupt this thing they, they think is happening. That's, that's mm-hmm. what's weird. This is very long-term planning. Isn't that what we're asking them to do? Uh, take, yes. take a look at the long-term and you know, think in terms of big systems and then take you know, action that you think, think will Think globally, interrupt. act locally, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and what's, what makes us even more you know, wicked and um, frustrating is that a lot of the underlying a lot of the the underlying facts are con, are um, con, congruent with what they're fearing. I mean, right. it, you, in the United States, white people will be a minority, right? You know, by the middle of of the century, very likely. Okay. Um, immig- you know, immigrants cause a lot of economic and cultural disruption. Not always problems, mm-hmm. but there is you know there are real issues around. Um, how well you have d- different cultures intermix with each other. Uh, what are your n- norms coming into a society that might have different norms around women, around you know sexual minorities? And by having these idiots embrace these issues, uh, it makes it harder for the rest of us to talk seriously about. Okay, well, what does this mean? How do we adapt to this? Because I can tell you one thing that the, the immigration problem is problem. The immigration issue is not going away. In fact, it's going to get a hell of a lot worse 
over the next couple of decades as we start getting seeing serious climate refugees. Climate refugees, exactly. Climate yeah. slash economic refugees from climate. Yeah. Stress, it's, et it's the one thing that makes me think that Bannon might be smarter than he appears. You know, that this might be the whole immigration story might be you know, uh, Steve Bannon's thoughts around climate adaptation. So, so Bannon, I think, is seeing these long-term trends and saying, awesome, we can play this up as a political movement and create enough stress that we provoke fear everywhere. When we provoke fear, everybody's long-term thinking shuts down. Their ability to consider opposite points of view shuts down. If we can couple this fear with stay in the herd and a membership sort of part of it, we could run the table for a while politically. And I think that's what's happening. Everybody's long-term thinking shuts down, so our long-term thinking dominates. Right. Well, it's interesting. I was. I've been one of the things I've been looking at. There was a good interview with uh, Ezra Klein and, and Whitney Phillips talking about uh, the you know alt-right media on the platforms and how the platforms, you know, are, kind of are able to radicalize people um, by uh, surrounding them with radical content. But then the media producers get rewarded with the metrics that, from doing that, and then they actually move right. So they move people to the right, and then that moves the media producers to the right, which moves the people to the right. So you extend the tail. You see, right. and so it's not like we're just you know, having a static situation where this is happening. We actually have a situation where it's dynamically getting worse right? yeah. because of our media platforms. And it struck me that like Trump is doing kind of the same thing. You know, he goes out and says something to the right and his audience responds with, you know, send them back or something like that. So he says, "Woo, that works. I'm going to go farther to the right, yeah. right, which brings his crowd to the right. So there's actually a dynamic thing that's going on that's, you know, that's moving, that's, that's splitting us up. And I was trying to figure out what the equivalent is on the left. It's a little bit harder to, you know, Medicare for all. Is that, you know, we're going farther left and we want health care for everybody? I don't know. But, um, but so many people will die. Yeah, it's like, you know, that's that's the leftward version of this. I don't really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Version, but I haven't, I haven't spotted it. And I was, I was, um, yeah, anyway. So, so the, and what was, what was really striking me was I, I saw a post from Maya Zuckerman and she was uh, uh, from a New York Times article about how we surround, we, you're able to take these marginal entities and consolidate them into kind of a powerful platform, right? The, the alt-right, the alt-right is this, bunch of marginal things, but YouTube aggregates them into a, a, net, a huge network. Hmm. And, and I was realizing that I, that's exactly what I want to have happen around regenerative agriculture. I want to take a whole bunch of small disaggregated kind of media platforms and aggregate them in a way that they become a social force. And it was like, oh, I want to do exactly what YouTube And said. it's what I'd like to do with Design from Trust, Jermaine. And um, do you, you guys all remember John Perry Barlow's Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace? Sure. Way, way back in the 90s. Um, this, what we really hoped back in the early days of cyberspace, back when, you know, there was no web, really, but there was Usenet, and, but there was a sense of this is an emerging phenomenon that will be transformative. We really wanted it at, to be a medium through which marginalized groups who thought they were alone could come together and create community, could find commonality with each other and develop a kind of strength that they never knew they could have because they had been so alone, so um, diffuse. And we were right, and it <laughs> sucks. <laughs> well, one, one quote that I want to throw out here that I sent to Jerry for a different reason this morning, what, but it strikes me that it, it just captures a lot of my thinking and, and yours now, which is uh, the invention of the ship was also the invention of the shipwreck. Uh, I thought you were going to say the invention of the ship was also the invention of the global slave trade, but I guess yeah. six is one half dozen together. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's fascinating. If, if you, you can step back and pretend not to be a human for a moment, it's, it's fascinating to watch this process in action. Um, and I really fear where it's leading because one of the things that seems really patently clear is that when these marginalized but armed subcultures 
feel that their means of community will be taken away. 8chan is being shut down. Um, the Donald subreddit has been quarantined, um, which makes it like basically impossible to find unless you're already a member. Um, they're not going to give that up. At least not, they're not going to give that up willingly or easily or without um, a, re a reaction. And I don't know what will happen, but I fear what might happen if, uh, if Trump is not reelected next year. Um, because there will be people who find, who believe, well, there'll be, there will certainly be people who will be motivated by, uh, by Trump to believe mm -hmm. that this was all a fraud, mm -hmm. that this has been, that this was stolen, that, you know, your, your favorite president is being taken from you illegally by um, immigrants and by liberals. And, and by people wearing red glasses. And by people wearing red glasses instead of a red hat. Well, and, he, um, and he's playing that up. No, oh, course. yeah. No, no. He, no. He's already saying that. I don't know if you saw it. Was just the yesterday third term, before. fourth term. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know if, if, the press, if the press was being honest, they wouldn't even need to have an election. They'd say, you just go ahead, another four more years. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just. And so I want to believe that this is uh, bluster and noise and he will, and he will collapse um, because that is outside of this, uh, this other kind of power that has, that has developed. That's probably what would happen. He's, he's, a, he's bluster, not a lot of power. He's desperate for attention and uh, approval. But it works. But in this case, it's working. And there are people who don't, who won't be quite so ready to back down. Mm -hmm. Yay. I know. Welcome to the future. There'll be therapists in the lobby on your way out. <laughs> um, th therapists on one side, pistols on the other. Exactly. And I, I just, uh, as we wrap this call, I just want to offer some gratitude for the fact that as far as I can tell, all of us are working on this chewing on this in our own way, in different ways, in actually quite remarkably different ways that have these lovely dovetails into each other um, that I really appreciate. And so thank you for showing up wholeheartedly and sharing of what you're doing. Uh, and Kelly is off to lie down in a dark room. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we need the, yeah. like the, the sensory deprivation tank. I think it sounds time for the gin. Time yeah, for the gin, gin is a totally again. acceptable alternative to the dark room. <laughs> That's and I, you, Jerry. I, I'm sorry that I that this ended up being the last part of the conversation today. We sort of left without feeling being able to build ourselves back up. And We're going I, to, I, I, I apologize for that. Next time. We're going to end with a reread of Nikki Giovanni's choices, just because I think it'll boost us a little bit. Although it's a bit of a sad poem, but here we go. <clears throat> choices by Nikki Giovanni. If I can't do what I want to do, then my job is to not do what I don't want to do. It's not the same thing, but it's the best I can do. If I can't have what I want, then my job is to want what I've got and be satisfied that at least there is something more to want. Since I can't go where I need to go, then I must go where the signs point, though always understanding parallel movement isn't lateral. When I can't express what I really feel, I practice feeling what I can express, and none of it is equal, I know. But that's why mankind alone, among the animals, learns to cry. With that, we'll wrap our check-in call. Thank you very much. I'll see you in a month, and see you on the list in between. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Nice to see you all. Bye. Okay, here.